Greetings everyone, my name is Ehav Ever, and in this video I will be discussing the issue of proving the existence of the Oral Torah. Now diving right into this topic without a lot of introduction, uh, there's three points that I will be discussing in this video. The first point being that any type of written instruction always has an oral component to it. The second issue I will be discussing in this video is that the Oral Torah is proven by the existence of ancient Jewish communities who state that they have an oral Torah. And the third point I'll be discussing in this video is that it is completely logical to have within a written text an oral component to it. Okay, now when dealing with the issue of written instructions, one of the things I can say from firsthand experience, and I know this of other people too, so I know I'm not the only one in the world with this issue, is that anytime you have something that is written, there always has to be some level of confusion about what is the true intent and meaning of every statement, of every word, and everything that is mentioned in those written instructions. Uh, one example I use is on the left, for example, as you see there's a Bowflex there. I once purchased a Bowflex, and upon opening it up and trying to put it together, I immediately came to a big problem within the first two or three pages that I didn't quite understand what the author of the instructions was getting at in terms of how to put the unit together. Now initially I thought it was just me, so I invited a friend over and he had the same problem I did, but that basically there was something in the instructions that seemed to be missing, and the only way to see to, we saw to really supplant that was to have someone who actually knew what they were doing, who had done it before, and who could orally explain to us what we were seeing in the written instructions. Now the same could be true, for example, building a house. I could easily write a book telling someone this is exactly from start to finish how you build a house. But obviously, there's no way a person would be able, to be, be able to build a house without actually having some oral component to it of explaining between the lines what exactly do you do here, what exactly does this mean. And at the bottom, for example, of this slide, you can see examples of street signs that might be confusing because one person may see it one way, another person may see it a different way in terms of what the meaning is, and the author of it may say, no, I didn't mean either one, either one of those things. This is what I meant instead. And you can basically think of it as trying to put something together that requires some level of teamwork. When it's just an individual thing, yes, perfectly fine. You know, a person can say, I'm going to come to my own conclusion, especially if they're the ones who wrote it, created it. But if you're having a situation where people have to work together to accomplish a certain goal, you know, there's always an element of when you have a written instruction, you always have to have an oral instruction that accompanies it to deal with the issues that come up and the questions that may come up. When two sides, for example, may decide, okay, well, wait a minute, I did it exactly as the way it was written. The other side may say, well, I also did it the way it's written. This is the correct way. And the other side says, no, this is the correct way. Now, the other issue is, is that, for example, there was never an oral component to anything that was written. There'd be no need to go to class. There'd be no need to have schools, institutions, or anything like that. A person, for example, on, let's say, the university level, could simply get all the books that they're ever going to like learn from when it comes to their like career in whatever field that they're diving into or learning from, and then just simply read all those books, take a test, and say, I'm done. Um, but as we know that you know, when you learn something, as an example of when I was in engineering school, when you learn something called EMC, you know, most of the time you're dealing with things that often uh, need some form of oral explanation because of the fact that some of the concepts are written in the book give you, uh, depending on the author, the theory in some cases, but they don't always explain how to do all of the math inc included in it. So they don't always step by step say, okay, this is exactly how you do it in this way. And if you have this problem, this is the way you do it this way. And if you have this one, this is the way you do it. In many cases, that's where the oral instruction comes in to explain between the lines of what the theory is teaching you, as well as the actual practical application is teaching you. Now, the first thing we need to deal with in terms of really diving into this topic is we need to understand that the Torah came from the creator of all things that you know we term as Hashem. Now, if Hashem is the one who gave it, Hashem is the one who defines how the Torah is to be understood. So one of the things we need to understand is what exactly is the Torah. So, for example, Hashem defines the Torah in terms of the different mitzvot that he gave, the different commands that were given, and that the basic Torah itself has uh, a basic claim that the creator of all things gave the written Torah. So the written Torah is the basis of all things. But you know, as we will see later, that always within a written text, there always has to be an oral component. So in order to determine how we are going to define this conversation, 
Uh, we're going to use certain statements that Hashem made in the Torah that was given to Moshe Rabbeinu, as well as some of the statements made by uh, some of the Nevi'im, uh, the prophets who were speaking about the Torah and how to correctly understand it. So the first concept is something that's mentioned in the Torah and Sefer Dorim that you see in the red box there, which is Tzedek Tzedek Tirdof. Tzedek Tzedek Tirdof basically means that um, the you could say truthfulness, truthfulness, or correctness, correctness, pursue. Uh, some people translate the tzedek tzedek as being, for example, righteousness, but you know, righteousness in English kind of is an open-ended thing, where the word tzedek often usually means uh, correctness or being correct, you know, right, for example. So that's something that uh, the people of Israel are supposed to pursue, being correct. Now the next thing is what's mentioned in the uh, prophet, uh, the Navi, Yeshua'u, when he mentions la Torah uli tuda, im lo yamuru kadavar hazeh, asher en lo shachar. Now, translated what that means, and you know, focusing in on the two red words that are um, shown in this text, the Torah, to the Torah, ul teuda, the teuda. If it doesn't speak like, if a, if a matter doesn't speak like these two things, then there's no dawn in it. There's no shachar. Now, the interesting thing about the word shachar, shachar represents the transition from darkness in the morning that well, becomes light. So the thing is, it says to the Torah and the teuda. Now the question is, well, why did the prophet here, what did uh, Yeshiau say to the Teuda? That's the second word that's in red. Why didn't he just say to the Torah? Well, the word Teuda, generally speaking, means like to a tradition or to an identifier. So, for example, you have a Torah and you have an identifier, something that identifies the correct tradition or the correct understanding of the Torah. If something doesn't speak like these two things together, then it has no dawn in it. It trans does not transition from darkness to light. Now the next thing is, is in the, the Navi, Malachi, he mentions, Zachru Torat Moshe Avdi, Asher Zeviti Oto Bechorev Al Kol Yisrael, Hukim Imeshpotim. So translated, what he mentions is, he tells all of them Yisrael to remember Torat Moshe, and basically remember the commands that Hashem gave to uh, Moshe and Horeb to all of them Yisrael, Hukim Imeshpotim. So basically, you could say statutes and also uh, judgments. Now, the next thing to analyze is something that is mentioned later in Sefer Dorim, in the Torah. And basically, it says, Zechor yamot ha'olam, ve'nu shanot dor v'dor, sh'al avicho v'yigidacho, zechunecho v'yomoru lecho. So this instruction is that when Am Yisrael want to remember the days of old, or the past, for example, it says to ask your fathers, and they will tell you, and ask the, uh, the, if you will, the Zekanim, which are almost like the, um, the wise men, the Chachamim, you know, in any generation, those who know Torah and who've experienced it and who've passed it on and have received it from a trustworthy source, ask them, those are the ones you go to. So it doesn't just say openly go to yourself. Don't think for your own, you know, what you will make up something for yourself. It says go to the past, ask the people who experienced it, ask your fathers and ask those who are in your community who are the Chachamim. And then the last thing we're going to analyze in this area is something that's mentioned in the, the book of Mishle, which says, Shema b'nei musar avicha, adat titosh Torah imecha. So again, this statement, basically, looking and concentrating on the red step parts of it, are saying that the musar, which is almost like the ethics, like, you know, go to your father for that, and the Torah temecha. So essentially what it's saying is, here are the, you know, the words of, uh, that have been passed down to you from your fathers and from your father's generations, and don't forget the Torah of imecha, of your mother. Okay, now when dealing with the oral Torah, and first we have to deal with the written Torah. Now the transmission of the written Torah can be summed up in basically what's in this slide. All of the most ancient uh, written texts that exist today, today in the Jewish world, whether it be from the Dead Sea Scrolls, whether it be fragments that are found around different parts of Israel, whether it be the oldest uh, Torah, uh, Torah scrolls, complete Torah scrolls found in the ancient Jewish communities like Iraq, Yemen, uh, different parts of Europe, whether it be the Aleppo Codex, whether it be the Leningrad Codex, all of these texts point to a central text that they're all translated from, or I guess, I guess you could say transmitted from, um, that basically proves out that more than 2,500 years ago, there was a common text. And all of these texts point to it because there's very few differences between them. And that's what we know that the rules of transmitting the written text has been more than 2,500 years old. But of course, we know it's older than that, but just saying from an uh, archeological perspective, the written text points to a more than 2,500 year old history of a common written alignment, if you will, between all ancient Jewish texts. What this essentially means is something that the Rambam mentions in the Mishnah Torah. 
In the Mishnah Torah in the uh, introduction, Rabbi Moshe ben Maimon states the following, Kolo Torah katva Moshe Rabbeinu kodem she yamud, the katav yado. So essentially what he says is like the whole Torah, Moshe Rabbeinu wrote before his passing away. And uh, he wrote it himself, basically, transcribing it from what Hashem gave him. V'natan sefer l'chol shevet v'shevet, v'sefer achad v'natanuhu v'auron la'ed. So essentially what he did was he took the uh, main Sefer Torah and he basically gave it to the, uh, put it in the Aron, while he gave a copy of a Sefer Torah to each of the 12 tribes. So essentially you had one master copy that he made that was kept in the Aron, that was kept in the uh, the Mishkan, you know, the uh, tabernacle, some people say. And then other copies were made and were given to all of the 12 tribes. So essentially before Moshe Rabbeinu died, he didn't just make one copy of uh, the text that he had written, that the written Torah itself had been passed on to all the other different tribes. So it wasn't just like one text that existed and no one else with a, a similar copy that he made himself. So what this means visually is, at first he writes the Sefer Torah, and then from there he makes copies of it, and then there's at least 13 copies at the time that existed at first from the start. Now, of course, from those copies, other copies were made. And in any time there was any kind of question, a person could always go back to the original, like Sefer Torah that Moshe Rabbeinu wrote, the first one at least, uh, the master copy that was found in the Oron. But all of the uh, other ones are also like master copies too. And from those master copies, copies were made and they could be compared because the tribes were close enough to each other in close proximity to where you could always go back and like say, okay, well, maybe this one had a mistake in it. Let me check the previous ones that Moshe Rabbeinu wrote. Now, it's interesting to note that there is a group of Israelis, if you will, who are called the Samaritans. The Samaritans have like a, a Torah text that differs from uh, the Jewish text within 6,000 places, but most of those are just differences in words that they chose, um, and also in like two main areas, but mostly it's the same text. Now, what's interesting is they have a similar history where basically what they say is something a little interesting in terms of their history. They say that Hashem Natan Moshe uh, Le Moshe Sefer Torah Mushlam Min Hashemayim. So Hashem basically the creator of all things, gave a Torah scroll to Moshe Rabbeinu that was complete. That basically the Torah as they have it, or they, as they claim they have it, was complete, and Hashem gave that to Moshe Rabbeinu. Kol Torah ze kadva Moshe Rabbeinu kodem she yamud v'chatav yado. V'natan sefer l'chol shevet v'shevet v'sefer achad natanahu v'aron la'ed. So essentially the same kind of process of Moshe Rabbeinu making copies of the Sefer Torah and giving it to each tribe they say that Hashem provided the first Sefer Torah, which was everything from the beginning of the Torah as we have today, Bereshit, all the way to the end in Devorim, and that Moshe Rabbeinu just simply copied that text that Hashem had given him, made copies for all the 12 tribes, and then took that one master copy from Hashem and put it in the Aron. So the same situation exists where there's a master copy, and then from there copies are made, and those copies are distributed, and then from there more people make copies of those master copies that came from Moshe Rabbeinu. So going from a historical and textual standpoint, what we see is that the, if you will, the singularity that we're going to be looking at for most of this discussion comes from the left, which says Torah at Mount Sinai. So Torah at Har Sinai. So from there, you have the uh, revelation where Hashem spoke to all of Am Yisrael and gave the Torah. After that point, basically, you have the establishment of the 12 tribes in the land of Israel. And then from there, you have a kingdom of Israel. And at some point later, you have a situation where the Samaritan sect basically broke off. And then another time later where the Karaites broke off. And then that produced the three groups who come from Mount Sinai. And that is Jews and Israelis who hold by Torah Moshe, whether it be Mizrahi Jews, Temani Jews, Sephardi Jews, Maghrebi Jews, Ashkenazi Jews, and Ethiopian Jews to the present day, which exist today. Or whether they be Karaites who exist today, or whether they be Samaritans that exist today. But these are the only three groups in the world who can trace themselves back to when the Torah was given at Mount Sinai, and there's been an unbroken chain of transmission from that time to this time, that also includes genetically too. So essentially what you have is three paths to Mount Sinai. You have the path of Moshe, um, Torah Moshe Jews, who have uh, an ancient ancestor named Avram Avinu. Uh, they hold that Hashem spoke to Am Yisrael at Mount Sinai, and accept the written Torah and also the rest of the prophetic writings and the other writings called the Tanakh. Next, you have the Karaites. The Karaites also claim to have an ancient ancestor named Avram Avinu, um, Avram bin Terach. They hold that Hashem gave, spoke to Am Yisrael at Har Sinai, at Mount Sinai, and they accept the written Torah and the Tanakh the same way that uh, Torah Moshe Jews do. Now with the Shomronim, you have a little bit of a difference here. 
but they also claim to have an ancient ancestor named Avram ben Terach, just the same way that Torah Moshe Jews and Kerites, uh, Kerites do. They, except for they have, they also hold that Hashem spoke to Am Yisrael at Har Sinai, and they also have, uh, which is a little bit different, is their own version of the Torah, which has six thousand differences between the Torah text of both the Torah Moshe Jews and Kerites. Now again, these differences are only are pretty much minor in most cases because they're either choices of words that are different, but they have the same meaning. They don't dramatically change the text. They only change the text in two areas where it still essentially is like recognizable as the same text. Now what's interesting is, is that they reject, for example, the authenticity of all the other texts outside of the Torah. So for example, they don't have like a, a Tanakh or like a, another group of texts like uh, going from the prophets and things like that. They don't use those as a book and connected with the Torah. For them, the Torah is the Torah and that's it. Now, dealing with the two non-Torah uh, uh, groups here that I'm mentioning, uh, one of the things that's interesting is that the Karaites, for example, accept that there's a written Torah that knocks, just like Torah Meshe Jews do. Now, one of the differences with the Karaites is that they reject rabbinical leadership, they reject rabbinical transmission, they reject the uh, oral Torah as it's found in the Talmud, but they have their own system of Torah interpretation called Sevel HaYerusha and Hakish. Now, what's interesting is Sevel HaYerusha and Nakish is never mentioned in the written Torah, but it's their way of saying that this is how they uh, do the practicality of the Torah. How do you practically do something? Well, they turn to Sevel HaYerusha and Nakish. Uh, two things never mentioned in the written Torah, but it's a method that they say is the correct methodology of uh, how do you actually interpret the Torah and understand the Torah. Uh, now, with the, Shum the Shumronin, the Samaritans that are on the right, they accept the ver their version of the Torah. They reject Jewish Torah texts. They reject non-Torah Tanakh texts, like, such as the prophets and the writings. They reject both rabbinical and Karaite leadership. They have their own version of the oral Torah, and they reject Jerusalem as a, a location of the, of the Beth Midash, of the temple. But it must be noted here that because the Shomeronim have their own oral Torah, which they admit is an oral Torah, that means that two out of the three groups who come from Mount Sinai claim that there is an oral Torah and the third group, even though they say that they don't really go by the oral Torah, they have something that is basically similar to it, which they call Sevel HaYerusha and Hakish, and that there basically says that there is a proper way to understand the Torah in written form that also has an oral component to it. Now this map here, <clears throat> the main reason I included this in this um, presentation was to show the locations of some of the most ancient Jewish communities, uh, which is an important point because the majority of these communities, in fact, really all of the ones we're showing here, have some record of having an ancient written Torah and oral Torah, which is used to interpret the written Torah. So it's a very important point when you're dealing with the most ancient Jewish communities having uh, the most ancient interpretation and the most ancient traditions of the Torah passed down from the time that Mount Sinai, when the Torah was given, until the present era. So essentially what this means is that if you look across the Jewish landscape, no matter what kind of uh, people you're looking at, whether they be from the Middle East, uh, whether they be from Africa, whether they be from Asia or even from Europe, that essentially there are going to be some set givens that are going to be similar no matter where in the Jewish world you go to with it when it comes to Torah Moshe communities. Uh, Torah Moshe communities have that similarity because there's an oral Torah that was passed down. Now the expectation would be that if that similarity didn't exist because of the oral Torah, there should be huge differences between what any practice has done in any community meaning that you should be looking at a situation where the only thing that's recognizable is the written Torah and nothing else should be recognizable at all because of the dispersion amongst these communities and being isolated from each other to some degree. Now, when we get into the actual learning of the Torah, because you know one of the questions that often comes up is how could you have an oral Torah when, um, you know, how could you pass on something oral for so long and never have it written down? Well, <clears throat> what we're going to get into now is, well, the, one of the reasons that you have that is because when you deal with the transmission of the written text, even writing that text includes an oral element to it because in the written text of the Torah, there's no explanation of how to write a Sefer Torah or even what a Sefer Torah should look like. But when you look at some of the oldest Jewish uh, like writings, they all look alike and they all look similar to each other and they're 100% recognizable as coming from the same source. So, of course, one question that we're going to have to deal with is, what exactly is the oral Torah? Now, one of the reasons I mentioned this as a question 
is because often people who, for example, don't know Hebrew for themselves and have no uh, background in the Torah in terms of like uh, their family, ancient history, or any connection to an ancient Jewish community. One of the first things they say is that there's no way there's no, an oral Torah, there isn't an oral Torah. Uh, but when you have to deal with the question, well, what exactly is an oral Torah? So basically to break it down, the, the basic understanding and the basic tradition is, is that when the creator of all things spoke to all the people of Israel, he spoke in a way that was both verbal, meaning that they heard a voice, or in some interpretations, they heard a lot of voices that spoke at once and gave them the first word of the Torah, which was the Ten Commands. So when that happened, there are some <clears throat> who basically state that the oral information that they had heard at the time was also written in the sky like fire, like in the sky, or as if lightning itself was like forming words in the sky. So that there was no question whatsoever that something beyond the realm of humanity was happening. And it wasn't just a situation where, for example, Moshe Rabbeinu was hiding on the top of the mountain and making something happen so people could see it. And then he all of a sudden appears later, but he was right there with them, experiencing the same thing that they're experiencing. So what this means is that the original Torah itself was an oral Torah. Because when Hashem spoke, he spoke it to the people of Israel and they heard it. And they also that they saw it, but it wasn't yet written down. So the next stage is, is that at certain point, certain points that are mentioned in the written Torah, for example, Moshe Rabbeinu started writing down certain things that he was told to write down by, by the Creator, by Hashem. Now, in terms of the actual or Torah beyond the written text itself, you have what's called laws that were given to Moshe Rabbeinu at Sinai, meaning that there's any amount of information that's in the written Torah that doesn't explain how to do a particular thing, but Moshe Rabbeinu received from the Creator how to do those things. And often that's either called Halakha la Moshe mi Sinai, or Kabbalah mi Moshe. Now the next thing that makes up oral Torah is that there were 13 principles of Torah exegesis. There was the Shosha Asurei da Midot, meaning that if questions arose in the future, future generations had information in the oral Torah that would allow them to analyze the written Torah and say, well, this is how we're going to make this decision in this day and time, because the process that Moshe Rabbeinu gave us of Halakha la Moshe mi Sinai uh, and Kabbalah Moshe, as well as these 13 principles, will allow us to make the decisions that we need to make to go forward in the future with situations that the written Torah never mentions. So a good example of this, Moshe, uh, going back to Rabbi uh, Moshe ben Maimon, he explains in his introduction to the Mishnah Torah, Kol mitzvah shenitnu lemoshe misinan, hapirushin nitnu. So essentially, every mitzvah that the Creator gives, he didn't just, for example, say, build a Mishkan, next, you know, keep Sukkot, next, put on Sitziot, next, put on Tefillin, next, and then keep going and going. For every mitzvah, there was an explanation. So as an example, build a Mishkan. Well, this is what a Mishkan is. This is what it looks like. This is how tall the, uh, the uh, parameters around it should be. This is how the, uh, the placement of the, um, the uh, Mizbech should be. This is where the Aron should go. This is what kind of materials to use, and so on and so on. You know, Sukkot, what's a Sukkah? Well, Sukkah can only be this high, this wide across. The materials to use are these. The, un the materials that are not permissible are these, um, and it should be done from this time of year. These are the people that are required to sit in it during the seven days of Sukkot, and so on and so on. Same thing with Sitziot. Here is Sitziot. These are what they look like. Here are all the different possibilities that you could do with it. This is what the Tehillet is, Tefillin. What's a totafot? This is mentioned in the Torah. You know, this is what a totafot is. This is what it looks like. This is what color it could be. These are the size dimensions, and so on and so on. So for every mitzvah that Moshe Rabbeinu received, there was an, uh, a pirush, an explanation of how to actually perform it. And this is what the Rambam mentions, that not just he, but all Torah Moshe Jews have the same information, that Hashem gave two things. He gave a, a uh, explanation of how to write the Torah and what's supposed to be in it, but he also gave how to actually do anything in it. And that when, uh, for example, in the Torah, when it mentions, the Rambam explains that the Torah, so that is the written Torah. So the mitzvah that's mentioned in that pasuk of the Torah, which is in um, Shemot, Kaf Dalet Yud Bet, and that the Torah itself is the written Torah. And when he mentions the mitzvah, the mitzvah is the oral Torah, the pirush, the un the uh, how to actually perform the written uh, text, how to actually perform the mitzvot of Hashem. This is further explained by uh, Rabbi Moshe ben Maimon in his um, 
uh, commentary on the Mishnah called the Pirush Le Mishnah. So essentially what we have is a situation where, for example, Hashem would tell Moshe Rabbeinu, just like as I mentioned earlier, you have a mitzvah to have a sukkah. Um, you will sit in a sukkah for seven days. This is what a sukkah looks like. This is what the dimensions are. These are the materials you can use. So here is the mitzvah, sukkot, seven days. Here are the uh, actual parameters of how to perform it, the perush. Now, in terms of well, how something like that could have been passed on from the time of Mount Sinai into the present day, that's easy. In pretty much every Torah Moshe community, we have a list of names of all the major individuals who received the, uh, of the oral Torah from Moshe Rabbeinu from his time until about the time of the Talmud. And basically, all the people who learned after those people were uh, also are also included in individual, like for example, family trees. So this is the names of all the individuals from the time of Moshe Rabbeinu to about the time of the Talmud, of uh, all the people who were the major players who received the uh, written and the oral Torah from previous generations. So for example, you know, if you looking at this on your own, okay, well you would have nothing to start with because if you don't know the language, you'd have to learn it. But prior to about 1,500 years ago, there were no Hebrew dictionaries or lexicons. And all the information in any Hebrew dictionary or lexicon came from an oral source because prior to that point, there were no like books like that. So essentially, for there to be no oral Torah, what you would need in the written Torah is, first of all, something that explains to you what the letters are and how, they're, how to actually pronounce the words. So you would have to have something that tells you this is Bereshit, Boro Elohim, because there's a number of ways you could ex you could uh, actually pronounce this and not have anything like that and have different words. Now the next thing you would need is an explanation of, like I said before, what these words mean. So then even further to that, besides just having the ability to pronounce the text, and besides the fact of having something to explain to you exactly what each word means, you'd have to have something that explains to you the concepts behind everything you just learned. So all of these things would have to be in each line of the written text in order for you to be able to go to the next line of the text. So this alone would basically prove that you would have to have an oral component to understand the written component, or else you would have to have a lengthy explanation of each line of each word of each pronunciation mark in the text itself before you could even like deal with what the text you know is about or how to practically follow it now here's a simple test of what i'm talking about here this comes from what's called shemot yud het basically from yud gimel to tav zayn so that's um exodus uh, 18 from uh, 13 to about 16. so what does this section say this section describes the situation where Moshe Rabbeinu had, uh, he and Am Yisrael, the people of Israel, had left Mitzrayim, and his father-in-law had come to see him and brought his family with him. So we're told that the next day that Moshe Rabbeinu uh, had woken up, and he was like sitting as a judge of all of the people of Israel. So his, his uh, father-in-law asked him, like, hey, you know, what is this thing that you're doing? And he basically tells him, like, uh, the people come to me from morning to night to ask of Hashem. And uh, I basically tell them what, you know, Hashem has told them and what the rulings are, you know. Um, so essentially it says, That's the first part in red. The second part, Sorry. So essentially what Moshe Rabbeinu tells him is that, hey, look, you know, I've uh, been, uh, you know, sitting in this position where like from morning to night people come and ask me about Hashem uh, to deal with like issues between people, uh, between, you know, each man and a man and his friend. And I've been telling them of the, of the Hukim of Hashem and his, uh, his Torah Tav. So here's the, the obvious question here. The written Torah never explains what these judgments were that Moshe Rabbein was making. Now, again, I'm kind of rushing through it for people who don't know the Hebrew very well. Again, Moshe Rabbein explains to his father-in-law that I've been judging between people and I've been uh, basically uh, doing like you know the, the job of a judge. But none of the rulings that he made for any of these individuals that he had been doing from morning to night are ever recorded in the written Torah. This means that there's a whole story, a group of stories here that are being left out of the written text 
that are never covered in the text and therefore are, if you will, an oral Torah if somebody were to explain what those rulings were because the text nowhere else explains what the rulings are and there's no allusions to them in any other part of the Tanakh. Now someone may say, well, if you look here, it's alluded to, but no, the text doesn't say that. The text doesn't say, and here are all the judgments Moshe had been, had been making from morning to night during that whole time. None whatsoever. So that means that that is a oral Torah because of the fact that it's a part of the Torah that's not written anywhere. So let's start looking at... Um, now let's start looking at um, some areas that of uh, the written Torah that will require an oral component in order to understand how to even perform them. Now one of the things that's mentioned uh, when it deals with like actual practices, um, and this is dealing with the issue of unbroken traditions, the Torah, the written Torah mentions at a certain point, so what it mentions here is that the Kohenim, the sons of Aaron, are supposed to uh, perform a particular bracha that is, that is supposed to be for the people of Israel. And um, basically it says, um, you will say to them, uh, a group of like, you know, three, you know, three or four statements. Now, the interesting thing about these three statements that are supposed to be made is it doesn't tell you, like, it doesn't tell the Konim when to do it. It doesn't tell them how to do it. It doesn't even tell them what a bracha is supposed to be. You know, so again, you'd have to, you know, have something that tells you what a bracha is this. They'll do it in these circumstances. And uh, these are the valid people who can do it. And this is the, uh, you know, the, the actual, you know, how they say it. Now, one of the interesting things in terms of pronunciation is the word that you see, which is uh, surrounded by a red uh, kind of like a rectangle, wihoneko. Now, the interesting thing is this word is pronounced wihoneko. It's not pronounced wihonecho, wihoneko. Now, where in the written Torah does it explain how to pronounce this word differently than the way it would supposedly seem like it would look? Well, there's no explanation whatsoever. The uh, use of the kaf sofi in this form doesn't show up a lot of places in the Torah, but it exists. So the thing is, there would have to be some oral Torah to tell you that this word is wihoneko rather than wihoneko, no, wihonecho. Now, another area that requires a certain logic of, a, of an oral Torah is when dealing with the Mishkan. The Mishkan, we've already covered it, and you see it pictured here, it's, it's depicted here, actually. This is more of a depiction rather than pictured. Uh, but the thing is, the Mishkan is mentioned as the um, the place where basically all of them Yisrael were supposed to, during the time of the, uh, the of being in the Midbar, were supposed to be uh, bringing the uh, Korbanot, bringing the different things they were going to bring to the Creator, uh, and also the Kohenim were supposed to be working there. Now, it's given certain dimensions. It's given uh, things to have like uh, certain natural materials used of it, uh, you know, like certain skins, wood, things like that, silver, gold. Um, but it's never mentioned that anything beyond it could ever be made. It just simply says make a Mishkan, gives an explanation of certain parts of it, some parts of it doesn't explain. But Shlomo HaMelech, he built a huge structure known as the Bet HaMikdash. Now, the thing is, the Torah never makes an explanation that you are permitted to make a Bet HaMikdash, a bigger, you know, like temple structure. It just simply says a Mishkan. It never gives an exp uh, any idea that you could do anything different than that. But later on, you know, the, the Nevim were told, that, okay, well, the Ketuvim, that he just did this and this is what was allowable. You know, but the written Torah never says to do such a thing. You know, so what's permissible, what's not permissible? Again, you'd have to accept that the, um, the Nevim and the Ketuvim were you know, some explanation of, of allowing him to do it and how to understand how to actually do it and what the dimension should be based upon, you know, the continued revelation that Hashem had with the people of Israel. Now, another thing is, uh, you know, dealing with uh, tefillin, also known in the Torah as tutafut. Now, it must be noted that for the last 2,400 years, tefillin have not really changed that much. If you look at a piece of the uh, tefillin from like more than 2,000 years ago, they don't look that different from tefillin today. In this picture here on the left side, you have tefillin that were found in Qumran. And those tefillin are about 2,000, I think 2,400, 2,200 years old or so between the two. And on the right side, you have tefillin that are about 100 years old from Yemen. 
Now, the thing is, if you look at the head tefillin, which are the ones that have the four little kind of sections on them, you could tell that these are tefillin, and you can look at them, and they're both pretty small. Now, the one on the left side from Qumran is really small. It's extremely small. The one from Yemen is also pretty small, but it's not as small as the previous one, but they still are distinct in that they, for example, on the head tefillin, have four compartments to which parts of the Torah are put in them, uh, or parts of like uh, uh, certain sections of the Torah are written out on another um, uh, uh, parchment and basically put inside. And it's interesting to note that in the last 2,000 or so years or so, the same texts are placed in the same compartments between the Qumran community, as well as the Yemenite community, as well as Ashkenazi Jews in Europe, as well as Jews in the Middle East and Africa. And that tells you something that for the last 2,000 years or so, there's been a continuous uh, tradition that's been passed on in oral form, and uh, that is the Torah Shabbat Peh. And it explains what exactly a totafot is and how to actually make one and what the variations could be in terms of, the, of, of making one. Now, the next thing that's interesting is if you look at the coin on the left side, you'll see that this is a coin from the time, I think, of the uh, Bar Kokhba revolt. And basically what's on the front of the coin is a lulav. Now, the thing is, if you look at a lulav that's used in the Yemenite Jewish community on the right side, it looks pretty much like the lulav on the coin. So that means that there's been a tradition of about 1,800 years of similarity to where a Jew from that period would easily recognize what's being done by a Jew of today, and there's like not a break in the tradition, which means that the oral Torah he was using to create the lulav he was making is the same oral tradition that exists today. So essentially what you have is a, situ or a circumstance where all Jews who hold by Torah Moshe, which is the majority of Jews today, have a tradition of there being an oral Torah. They have a history of an oral Torah being in their family. Now, this even includes those who are secular, and uh, in many cases, those who have walked away from uh, the Jewish community, because if you go back further enough to like their fathers or their grandfathers or their great-great-grandfathers or like one generation or two, three or four generations in their family, you're gonna find a group of people at some point back in their lineage that held that there was an oral Torah that they, their ancestors had perceived and it wasn't just like them sitting somewhere and receiving it from someone they never met before. It was from them receiving it from their fathers and their grandfathers, so on and so on. So to conclude, essentially the, the three things that I mentioned earlier, the existence of a written text always means that there is an oral text. You know, you can go to any author who writes a book and they can tell you that they did the best they could to transmit the ideas in the writing written form, but there's no way to transmit every idea. And that's one of the reasons that people who write books often do book tours. Because people have questions about, like, well, what did this mean? What did that mean? Well, it was written in the book. Shouldn't it be clear? Shouldn't everything be clear if you wrote it all out? Obviously not. The next thing is that the vast majority of Israelis and Jews of today have a history of both a written Torah and an oral explanation of it. And the last thing is that the oral Torah isn't just a must, it's a reality. Thank you. Have a good day.